Hi everyone, my name is Brendan Hall and today I'm going to talk to you about a science project I was very fortunate to be involved with and that is uh, using machine learning and computer vision techniques to analyze images of core uh, taken from the Chicxulub impact crater. So my collaborators on this project are Sean Gulick, Oriol Ray, Jens Ormul, and uh, all of the scientists from IODP Expedition 364 who, who did a fantastic amount of work on, um, on studying this crater and, and, and really finding out some interesting results. So I'm part of the Energy Solutions Group at NThought. Uh, specifically, I work on building machine learning based tools for geoscientists. And often this involves heavy use of the scientific Python ecosystem. And I'm glad to be able to share um, this work with you today on, on applying much of the scientific Python stack to to practical um, problem. So back in 2016, there was an international team of scientists that uh, ventured out into the shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of the Yucatan to drill into the peak ring of the Chicxulub impact crater. So you can see that in this uh, image on the left hand side. Uh, this is a, a gravity anomaly image and this interior ring structure here is the peak ring of this crater, which is a, a structure that occurs on very large impact uh, um, asteroid impacts. And uh, so this is this is an important crater. This is the the big one that uh, marked the end of the Cretaceous about 66 million years ago. And with it, the dinosaurs and about 75 percent of the species on the planet. And this project to drill this core was um, IODP ICDP Expedition 364. So IODP is the International Ocean Drilling Program and the International Continental Drilling Program. And they're international consortiums of, of many countries, over 30 countries that fund scientific drilling projects, uh, both in the oceans and, and on land. So, uh, yeah, why did they do this? So on most rocky planets, uh, impacts are one of the dominant processes that um, that rework the surface. And over geologic time, these happen pretty frequently and, um, you know, are constantly reworking and overturning the surface and so on. Uh, and so we can learn about this process by studying you know, a well-preserved structure here on Earth, and, and that is the Chicxulub crater. It's, uh, it was buried relatively rapidly, and so much of the structure of it, um, you know, is still preserved to this day, if we can drill down into it and extract, uh, and extract samples. Um, so yeah, this drilling project was a success. They ex extracted about 835 meters of core, uh, there's an image there of the of the jackup rig uh, they used uh, as part of the drilling project. Um, this talk is almost a continuation uh, of the SciPy keynote that Sean Gulick gave in 2017. Uh, he does a great job of introducing um, the project itself, uh, the discovery of the crater, um, the uh, extraction of the core, and so on. And I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. All right, so this is the overall structure of the core that was recovered. So there is a seismic line shown here uh, that's colored by acoustic velocity, which is related to basically the density of the rock, okay? And uh, it's overlaid over a, over a seismic image uh, that shows the structure of the peak ring uh, in this region. So you can see kind of layered carbonates on top and so on. And so they drilled in to the earth at this point, and at about 500 meters down, they started coring, okay? And coring, I used a sort of a special drill bit that extracts an intact cylinder of rock inside of it, and they drill all the way down to uh, about 1,335 meters, okay? Well into the basement rocks in that section, okay? And uh, yeah, there's a schematic here that shows the structure of the core they extracted. So at the top of the core, there was about 115 meters of um, uh, sediment, carbonates, and so on uh, that were deposited after the impact took place. Uh, and then below that is the, is the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, all right? That's at the top of the peak ring at about 618 meters. So that's a 
famous uh, boundary layer that's been observed all over the Earth that they were excited to find. Below that is about 130 meters of uh, what are called impactites, or rocks that are formed from the impact. All right, so melt rocks and clasts uh, of all kinds of busted up material that uh, I'm actually gonna focus more on in this talk. Below that is uh, 580 meters of uh, granite basement with kind of dikes in it and uh, all kinds of structure. What's interesting about this granite is it has very high porosity and it's extremely shocked. So it really underwent a lot of um, compression um, and, uh, and shock waves and so on because of the impact. And it has some very interesting characteristics that uh, they observed. So in terms of this talk, though, I'm going to focus on those impactites uh, that are located uh, just below the KPG boundary. So we have 130 meters of these. And what it is is a melt-bearing breccia. So we have melt rock, and inside of it are embedded all these different classes of rock. And as you move down through this section, you can actually see the size of these class start to increase. So at the top, they're quite small. You can see in the, uh, uh, the image here on the left, um, you know, submillimeter scale clasts up here. And as you go lower, these clasts get larger. Uh, and, you know, at the bottom, they're quite large, they're, you know, the size of your fist and even a bit bigger. And, you know, understanding the distribution of the shapes and sizes of these clasts can give insight into the processes that um, put that sediment there in the first place. So, you know, shortly after impacts, you have the transient crater being formed. Uh, and, you know, and then melt rock sloshing around and the ocean started to flood back in uh, and stuff raining down from the sky, tsunamis and surges and sykes and, and things like that. And you can, uh, you know, study what happened and in what order by looking at the particles and, you know, estimating how far these things travel. And we worked and we're reworked by fluid by looking at the roundness of them and so on. So the shapes and sizes of these things is really important to understand. The standard workflow to um, understand the shapes and sizes uh, is by a technique called line logging. Uh, and this is a technique that was pioneered by Jens Hormo, who did the work for Chicxulub, actually. Uh, and there's a couple of references there for, uh, uh, for his work on line logging. And, and what he does, at least in the case of Chicxulub, uh, is he uses a software application called JMicroVision. And, and that lets you kind of look at uh, the core, stretch out a virtual line across it at a point, and then uh, observe and measure each rock class that touches this line. So this is to, you know, make the measurement um, tractable, 130 meters of core. You know, there's a lot of clasts in those core images. So um, this lets you... Uh, you know, have a reasonable way of um, gathering a representative statistical sample of rock shapes and sizes. But even so, this is actually pretty labor intensive activity. And, you know, having looked at these images, I started to wonder if there was a machine learning classification or computer vision type of technique you could use to, to augment this workflow, to make it easier perhaps to use uh, his picks as training data to uh, make predictions over more of the core and so on. So, yeah, he did this measurement uh, for, uh, for all the cores in this region. And these are the aggregate statistics um, plotted in this uh, plot at the bottom here. So the number of clasts per meter, the class size per meter. So this shows that there's definitely a finding upward trend along this entire section. Um, the relative amount of clasts to the, um, the the matrix that embeds these things, the roundness of the material. This can give clues as to how far uh, the particles traveled and bounced around with each other and were worn down to a more rounded shape before they were finally deposited. And the size sorting or you know the distribution of different shape sizes. So in computer vision terms, you know, what we really want to do with these images is an instance segmentation. We want to segment out the instances of all these different class types in there and then get a measurement of their, of their sizes. 
so um, yeah, this is a pretty well studied uh, image analysis task. And there have been some deep neural network models developed in the past few years that do this task really quite well. So there's UNETs out there and mask RCNN uh, and so on. Uh, one thing, though, is that these generally require densely labeled training data uh, to do it. So I have this example image here, sorry, showing um, an instant segmentation. And the training data required for this actually looks, looks like this data. You need to send in patches of completely classified uh, and segmented images in, in order to train up these models. And you need quite a few of them. And so that puts a large burden on the job of the scientist if they have to you know, account for every single pixel in these images. And these are, these are pretty high resolution images. And so that wouldn't really improve their their workflow or lifestyle very much. So what we really need is a, is a technique that allows us to use sparsely labeled data. So, you know, just um, the identification of a few representative classes of each type, for example, um, you know, and as little data as possible, ideally, for developing a practical augmented workflow. So the first thing we said about doing actually is building a tool that uh, allows um, the scientists to easily label these images. And so, uh, yeah, we've, we have a tool for quickly labeling geologic images like this uh, for core and also rock thin sections and so on. Uh, it lets you quickly label whole grains and clasts and manage the taxonomy uh, of the label or class types across all the different core sections. So we use this to label a few representative sections um, throughout this uh, impactite region to create the, uh, the training data. So this is a piece of software we built using the NThought scientific uh, software suite, which is a Python-based suite of tools for building and deploying science-focused applications like this. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the details of the actual approach. So this, the machine learning model itself was all written using Python and, and demoed in Jupyter Notebooks. So at the end of the presentation, I'm going to share a link to a repo with uh, notebooks and code that points to the data and so on. So you can see how it's implemented. I'm not going to show much code here. I'll just show the, you know, the libraries that I'm using um, so we can talk about that. But um, yeah, so um, now that we sort of have a labeled uh, relatively small subset of pixels from our image, uh, we'd like to train a machine learning model, a supervised machine learning model, um, to discriminate and identify the different class types based on some features. So just using the RGB color features, for example, from the original image won't be that effective. Uh, you know, if we are use a pixel-based classifier because we've only labeled some of the pixels, uh, you know, white, um, you know, the bright white class might look similar to the liner or the dark melt rock might look like void space and get confused and we wouldn't get a very good classification. So it would be good to have a more robust set of features that can discriminate different textures uh, and so on. So. As it turns out, one of the reasons that convolutional neural networks are effective uh, is that they, they get trained to identify, you know, discriminative features and textures uh, in the original images. So unfortunately, we don't have enough data to train convolutional neural networks from scratch. Uh, but what we can do is potentially is use a CNN that has been pre-trained on a large corpus of images already, like ImageNet. And one of the characteristics of these models is that you know, the early layers are actually sensitive to fairly low level uh, textural features uh, in the image. So things like edges and smooth areas and um, primitive shapes and so on. And as you move through the network, the textures and the features that it um, is sensitive to uh, get more and more sort of high level. So eventually towards the end, it'll respond to complex objects, maybe like eyes or 
dogs and cars and things. Uh, we, might, we might not want that, but those early textures at the beginning of the network could be useful to uh, represent the features that we're looking for. So what we do is for each of uh, the labeled pixels in the image, we extract the corresponding activations uh, through some of those early layers of the network. Okay, and we stack those um, all those activations that correspond to a given pixel up into a feature vector. So in this particular case, we're going to take the pixel features from the first two max pooling layers, okay, the ones that sort of um, sum up and aggregate features from the early activation levels, into a feature vector, okay? So this gives us a uh, what's called a hypercolumn or the set of activations that correspond to a given pixel, uh, which is a feature that responds to you know, all of the filters and textures in the early layers of that network. And so I've shown you what a couple of those layers look like in um, both of the max pooling layers. So this first image here is the 28th activation of max pool one and the 51st activation of max pool two. Both of these layers were actually important features uh, in the classification. Uh, you can see that um, the uh, the left image here is responding to kind of flat, bright textures. Uh, the one on the right-hand side, uh, more to edges and so on, to give you an intuitive feel for what some of these activations look like. So we have 192 of these features from the max pooling layers that we extract. And we also are going to stack on the three color features from the original uh, image uh, as well uh, as features for the classifier to use to discriminate between these class types. Good, so the classification itself, um, now that we have some labeled data, uh, is uh, sort of described on this slide. So uh, for one of the representative core sections that I've been showing here, here is what some of that labeled data uh, looks like. So there's actually about 14 different class and object types that we're uh, looking for here uh, listed along the side. So uh, the matrix is orange, the material that embeds everything. Uh, there's the liner. So the core is actually embedded in a plastic liner that we have to identify as well, or else it'll be um, you know, classified as some kind of rock type. And void, which are breaks and cracks within the core, uh, as well as the, all the different uh, class types that are here. So we, um, we extract uh, the labeled pixels, their corresponding feature vectors, and then use a boosted tree model to train a classifier um, on that training data and make an initial prediction. All right, so we had a 90-10 split between the training and the test data and got a weighted F1 score, actually, of, uh, of 0.91 uh, based on that data. So. Uh, reasonably accurate prediction, but as you can see in the image on the right-hand side, it's uh, it's actually quite noisy. Um, you know, it's speckly, and that's due to the pixel-based nature of this classification. So this classifier doesn't take adjacent pixels into account when it makes a classification. So, you know, it can be a pretty noisy classification result. So what can we do about that? Well, we can do regularization actually to uh, um, you know, take some of the spatial information in the core into account. So in this case, we're gonna use a conditional random field, which is a type of probabilistic graphical model. And what it does is it can model the relationships between uh, the pixel labels in the image, all right? So we wanna maximize the probability of a label assignment uh, given all of the data that we have available. Okay, and we do that by kind of formulating a, an energy function and, and, and minimizing it. So in this case, the energy consists of two parts. Uh, one, you know, in CRF language is called the unary potential, okay? And this represents the relationships between uh, the, the class labels themselves and the local image features, or the hypercolumn in this case, that we use to predict it, okay? so. Uh, this is just the, um, the class probabilities that are the raw prediction results from, from the boosted tree model I showed on the previous slide. And the pairwise potential represents relationships actually between the labels of the different pixel pairs within the image. 
Uh, so for example, if you have a pixel uh, of one class and it's surrounded by you know, all pixels of a different class, that isolated pixel is probably misclassified and it will tend towards the pixel of all the surrounding classes and so on. So that's the basic idea. Uh, I used a library called PyDense CRF uh, with a link shown here uh, and a reference to the uh, original paper it came from at the bottom. And um, it's a very efficient library uh, at applying um, a CRF to images uh, to accomplish this kind of regularization. And you can see the results are pretty significantly cleaned up compared to the, uh, the raw prediction results. And I stuck the label image there uh, just, for, just for reference. So once we have that classified image, actually, then we can uh, proceed to a shape analysis. We want to analyze the uh, um, shape of the clasts and get the sizes out to see if we can match up with uh, the line logging results that were done earlier. So here we have isolated the white carbonate clasts, which are those bright rocks, uh, bright uh, white rocks uh, in the left-hand image. And uh, scikit image actually has pretty good tools for measuring the properties of continuously labeled regions. So segmenting these out actually wasn't a challenge because they were separated pretty well from each other anyways. And so in this case, I didn't have to do a lot of post-processing work to segment those images, uh, to segment those classes, so, sorry, though that's often the case. Um, but using region props from scikit-image, we can automatically extract the size and the aspect ratio and the orientation of all the clasts uh, of, of each given type. And so I've shown that in the plot uh, here, the mask uh, uh, of these uh, clasts of white carbonate, uh, bounding boxes around them and the orientation of their two principal axes. Uh, I've shown the class size and I plot it as a line plot here and the aspect ratios and so on. And so I applied this method then to each of the core images through this entire section and uh, averaged the results uh, for each core and got the results shown here on the right hand side. So the blue results are the are the aggregated results from from machine learning and the orange results are the results from line logging. So this core specifically is this point shown by this dashed line here and across. And so you can see that we captured the essential trends that were observed in line logging. Uh, pretty similar on the class size and so on. Things get a little different towards the, uh, the bottom sections of the core uh, where some strange things start going on with melt rock actually dominating here. Um, but, uh, but in all, we had reasonably good agreement. And these results were published uh, late last year, actually, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in a paper written by Sean and, um, and uh, many of the contributors from this project uh, and called the first day of the Cenozoic, which described you know, the events that happened in the minutes and hours after the initial impact. So that's an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting read uh, if you'd like to take a look. So in conclusion then, um, what we've demonstrated here is a, is a technique for uh, doing an instant segmentation uh, of geologic images uh, that can be trained using relatively sparsely labeled training data. And this comes up a lot in scientific image analysis. And what we're working towards here, what the intention is, is to you know, develop augmented workflows for core image analysis. So you know, using some interpret interpreted data from uh, geoscientists and scientists and so on, uh, but using that to um, uh, help them classify faster and better and more re reproducibly and so on. So this method can be applied to instant segmentation and thin section images and satellite images. And I've shown a couple examples of problems I've applied it to as well. So this image on the left-hand side uh, is core images from a different core. Um, that had plug holes taken out of it. And I was able to actually identify the location of all of those plug holes automatically all the way down through the core. Uh, there's a rock thin section in the center. I'm gonna use this method to identify uh, the different mineral types 
porosity and uh, indeed a satellite image uh, on the right hand side. So segmenting out different uh, regions of cropland usage types, etc. So I want to thank everyone for their attention today. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much.